Conservation Association's highest national accolade, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Award, and the Bainbridge Island Chamber of Commerce's 2017 Citizen of the Year. Clarence is the principal of Forest Edge Communications, and he has served as CEO of the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Washington, a senior aide and spokesperson for President Bill Clinton, Governor Mike Lowry, Congressman Jay Inslee, Lieutenant Governor John Sherber, and the Washington State Senate, Kitsap County Sound Transit, and the Portland Rose Festival Association, and campaign manager for the ACLU of Washington. Clarence was also a news reporter and program producer for three Seattle radio stations, a member of the Tukwila City Council, and candidate for the Washington State Senate. He has served on the board of directors for numerous statewide, regional, and local organizations, and he is the first state's first and only 12-year-old Eagle Scout. So, uh -huh. today, please join me in welcoming Clarence Boyd-Walkie as he leads us in conversation. It is titled, Let It Not Happen Again, Lessons of the Japanese American Exclusion. Clarence. You guys want to come in? Come in now, get a seat. So I want to show a hand. How many of you guys have put together, presented, or watched a PowerPoint? <laughs> right? Well, I, this is a PowerPoint presentation I'm just warning you, and I hope that it's not going to be torturous for you. So I call this the presentation of four H's, history, honor, healing, and hope. Start with history on Bainbridge Island, and the first people, the indigenous people. This is a picture of Suquamish. They were in Central Puget Sound, the biggest tribe in the area, and they were there for about 11,000 years. They had a lot of famous chiefs. Kitsap was one, which is the county where Bainbridge is located. And their most famous son was Chief Self. Chief Self is a namesake for the city of Seattle. The first Europeans did not arrive until 1792. This is a depiction of Captain George Vancouver's ship, the HMS Discovery, and he had anchored off of Bainbridge Island. In 1841, the United States Navy came and followed after Vancouver. And this guy, Wilkes, Charles Wilkes, circled the island liked it, named it after his good friend Commodore William Bainbridge, who never set foot in Washington State. <laughs> what they found on the island were massive resources, the lumber. Everywhere from British Columbia all the way down to California, massive old growth forests. Some of these trees were 1,500, 1,600 years old. You can see this man in the lower right of this tree. That's probably a middle-aged tree. That tree may be only maybe four or 500 years old. And so what this was was resources. This is a picture of the Port Blakely Mill. Up and down the west coast, they had mills. They had water and a railroad, they put mills in. At the end of the 19th century, this mill on, on Bainbridge Island was the largest lumber mill in the entire world. It brought people in all over from Croatia and Sweden and Norway, Norway and Japan, China, and the Philippines. Everybody worked at the mill. You can see also in this picture on the right, those stacks. That's the Hall Brothers shipyard, which were building the largest ships in the world at that time. And everybody in the mill got to know each other, regardless of background, and became a very tight-knit community. And in the 1880s, the U.S. Census came out to this territory and wanted to document people, but they found names like mine, Moriwaki or Suimak, so it's too hard to pronounce or spell, so they simply gave you a number, so you were known as, let's say, Jap number 55. This is a picture of what Port Blakely looked like at its peak at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. You can see all the industry around it. I'm going to focus on the two pioneer villages that were at the southeast, southwest part of the harbor, Yama and Nagaya. Nagaya was the town that was built when the first folks came, working in the mill. They started to bring over their families. They had their picture brides, and they brought their families over, and they lived in Yama. Yama in Japanese means mountain or hill. Fujiyama, simply Mount Fuji. This is a picture of Yama. They built all of their houses out of the spare lumber from the lumber mill. It's worth noting that the Japanese came in the 1880s and after because of a major recession in Japan. Most of the other people who came, they came, they were skilled laborers, worked in the lumber mill, or were able to build ships. But many of the Japanese were professionals back in Japan. And so they started the company town through Blakely Harbor. They created the Washington Hotel, a restaurant, a grocery store. Here's Mr. Takayoshi's mercantile store. And the most popular business that they started was the ice cream parlor. Mr. T Mr. Takayoshi had to order ice to take care of this stuff. So it was a very expensive enterprise. He was one of the first people in Central Puget Sound to have a telephone. 
By the way, that Port Blakely mill, it had electricity 10 years before Seattle had electricity. It was such a thriving business. So the community was getting along. All those people who worked at the mill also shopped at those Japanese uh, businesses, so we, it became very, very close-knit, very tight-knit. The mill had burned down twice in its operation, and in the 1920s, they stopped operation because all of the old growth lumber had been cut down, so people had to find other things to do. What the Japanese did, a lot of them, was start strawberry farms. This is the, anybody been to Bainbridge Island? Got off the ferry? Okay, so see where those strawberry farms end, you see kind of the blank field there? That's the highway that comes up from the Winslow Ferry Terminal going off the island. And in this corner, this corner right here, they drove through, that's McDonald's. These guys are at Safeway. <laughs> they had no idea. Um, it was a very arduous thing. You saw the picture of that one tree. There were trees that were even larger. Now think about those stumps. You know, the stumps would go all the way from one of them, two of them would fill up this room. So they used surplus dynamite from World War I plus horses, digging out those stumps and then clearing this land. The Japanese started strawberry farming. It became very prosperous. They even had a big strawberry plant in Eagle Harbor. They had other businesses too. Bainbridge Gardens is a big nursery. This is their grocery store. It had a gas station. Bainbridge, through this time, was a very closed ecosystem, both economically, socially, and, and so they shot together. They worked together. The, the ferries coming to Seattle was a very rare trip. So it became very tight knit. It became very close. This is very important to the Bainbridge Island story. And another thing that kept the island very close was our state, Washington, was one of the first states to have compulsory public education, which means every child must go to school. So you have to go to school. And so these children would also get to know each other, became very close friends. I would contend that no baby is born prejudiced. So these children got to be very close friends. And then the world changed for the entire United States. December 7th, 1941 was when the Imperial Forces of Japan came to the US territory of Hawaii and the Southern Fleet inside of Pearl Harbor was bombed. On that day, and the day after, the FBI went to 23 cities in the territory of Hawaii, and without search warrants, took whatever they wanted, what they considered contraband, or radio, shotguns, cameras, those kind of things, and in less than 48 hours, arrested actually, arrested actually 1,291 people. This is a map of the cities that they took, and you can see in those circles with how many Japanese were arrested from those places and taken into custody. I'd also like to stress to you guys, this was done 79 years ago. So we didn't have wonderful computer graphics. These maps had to be hand drawn and all these and all the stuff had to be put in there. So they already had their plan to publish this map. This map wasn't just put together in an afternoon. On December 11, 1942, the Western Defense Command was created that was four days after Pearl Harbor. And General DeWitt here was the first commander. A few months later, on March 2nd, 1942, he issued Public Proclamation Number 1, which designated military areas on the West Coast, the western halves of Washington, Oregon, all of California, and southern parts of Arizona. And in those areas, there was a curfew imposed on everybody of 116th Japanese ancestry. They had to be in a home at 8. They could not come out until 6 in the morning. It was only imposed on the Japanese Americans. We were also at war with Germany and Italy, but German Americans and Italian Americans had free reign to do whatever they wished. And then, two months and a week after Pearl Harbor, actually yesterday, 78 years ago, President Roosevelt signed this executive order. And it let those military authorities have full power to exclude civilians in any area without trial or hearing. On a month later after this signing, he signed Executive Order 9102. It established what was called the War Relocation Authority. That was a civilian agency which later would be in charge of developing, planning, and administering all of the concentration camps. The first director was Milton Eisenhower. The very first civilian inclusion order came to Bainbridge Island. This is a picture of them on March 24th, 1942. And it says, all persons of Japanese ancestry will be removed in six days. You were only allowed what you could carry or wear, and you had to take care of all your affairs. You were going to have to show up at the Eagle Dale Ferry Dock on March 30th. Four, three families from Bainbridge Island did move to Moses Lake prior to the forced removal, but all the rest were going to be taken away. They had to figure out what to do with all of their properties. On March 24th, you can see this picture here, they had to come to the Anderson Hardware Store among those six days. 
this picture was taken on March 25th, and everybody had to show up. You had to show me a real person. So if you had that baby, you had to bring the baby to prove that you had the baby. This picture was taken a day after that poster was put up. And this is a picture of Mr. Avonso Aroto and his wife, Miki. And you can see them smiling there. I would suggest that after this picture was taken, or shortly after, they probably weren't smiling. Because Mr. Aroto is a Filipino-American. And his wife, Miki, was Japanese-American. And since he was Filipino-American, he was forbidden to go with his wife. He had said, I will renounce my citizenship. I will do whatever you want to allow me to go with my wife. But the military would not allow it. So we have to figure out what these farmers, and I'd like to add, at the beginning when those farmers started those strawberry farms, if someone were smart enough and had the resources, they bought property. But because of the Asian Exclusion Act and the alien land laws in 1924, the Asian Exclusion Act essentially put a wall in the middle of the Pacific stopping any person of Asian ancestry from immigrating to the United States. They bought property before that, they were good. After that, you had to be a U.S. citizen to buy property. It was against the law if you had not become a citizen. This is a picture of Mr. Akio Suimatsu, but he bought his property in the mid-1930s, 10 years after the Asian Exclusion Act, but he still owned his property. How was he able to do that? The landowner was his five-year-old son. You could buy it if you were a citizen, and so a lot of the properties on Bainbridge Island were owned. We literally had five and 12-year-old landholders on Bainbridge Island. Here he is signing it over to his neighbor, and every one of the Bainbridge Islanders who had a farm and a neighbor, they all pledged to look after it and take care of the affairs. Finally, the day arrived, March 30th. You can see the soldiers gathering there. This is a picture of the current Winslow dock. They're boarding this ferry. They will go to the other side of the harbor, to the south, where Eagle Dahl is, and that's where all of the people will be gathered. If you couldn't get to the ferry dock, the government gave you a free bit of transportation. This is the troop carriers. They would come and pick you up. And again, everybody had to be taken away. This includes the orphans, the few orphans that were on the island. And that's our oldest citizen at the time, Reverend Hirakawa. He's 77 years old, accompanying those orphans. This is a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Moji. Uh, he's in his 50s and she's in her 40s. They're, they're a well-known couple and very kind throughout the community. They were a childless couple. I've uh, never been told whether that was by choice or maybe she wasn't able to conceive a child, but they were well known because they always had a child, and in this case it was their dog, King. King was well known on the island. You can see them there, a white Samoya, pretty exotic dog, especially back then. And I'm told that he was well loved because he never barked, he never bit. Children could ride on this dog. He was just a lovely dog, and he wanted to go with his parents, if you will. But the soldier said, no, you can't take your animals. Shortly after this picture was taken, the two soldiers you see there closest to King pulled out King. King, for the first time in his five-year-old life, almost bit these soldiers and barking vigorously and fighting them. He said that those two soldiers to restrain King as the truck was being taken away. The Mojis, like the other families on Bainbridge that had their farms, their neighbors also said, of course, we'll look after King and look after your farm. But King, this healthy five-year-old dog, was so despondent that he refused to eat or drink and he died in less than a week. This is a picture of Fumiko Hayashida. This is a really famous picture. Um, by the way, a lot of our pictures are in the books, a couple of them here. And I'll point out that they were taken by the Seattle Post Intelligence or they came to the island. Scores of photographers and, and reporters. That's how we know all these stories because they were there to witness them. She's 31 years old in this picture. Her, her daughter there is barely a year, 13 months. That's Natalie. And she is pregnant with her third child, Leonard, who would become the first Japanese-American baby born in a concentration camp. The soldiers became very close to the Bainbridge Islanders over those days, and they did everything they could to make this removal as easy as possible. They talked about how tight this community was, friendships that they had. There were several seniors, both girls and boys, that skipped their classes under threat of expulsion because they wanted to say goodbye to their friends. There was a handful of senior boys, uh, five or six, that actually went on an early ferry to Seattle just to be there to greet them for their last moment to be taken away. The soldiers were very close. Walt Woodward, the editor of the paper at the time, said, quoted by the uh, commanding officer, we don't know, this is the hardest thing we've had to do. We don't know why we're doing it to these people. And he also noted that every soldier had tears in their eyes. I'm also going to add that their billet 
their meshing was going to be over on this day, March 30th. But because they got so close to the Bainbridge Islanders, these guys who came all the way from New Jersey, that's how everybody remembered them. They had these weird accents, is what they said, the Jersey accents. And they wanted to stay. So they said, I don't know, where are you going to take them? So they had their mission, or they had their uh, orders extended. So they, had, they went with them to Seattle, and they accompanied them on their trip. Here is a picture of what the Eagle Dale Ferry Dock site was. The ferry dock is off to the left of this picture. You can see the soldiers assembling to escort the Japanese, the Japanese Americans, and they're brought over in their cars, marching down the former Eagle Dale Ferry Dock. In this photograph, there's 227 Japanese Americans boarding the ferry Hoboken. It arrived at 11.03, it left about 10 minutes later. And this is Fumiko Kurofirta, she's saying goodbye to Bainbridge Island. And then he arrived at the Seattle dock. And you can see in the background that walkway, that was the very last thing of the Seattle vibe that was taken down that walkway. Thousands of people came to watch them being taken away. And they're all walking away, these are the Hayashidas from Bainbridge Island. And on the train, you can see on these blinds, they're very dark. Those blinds were pulled down they couldn't let light in, they couldn't see out, and they had to stay down the entire three-day, two-night trip. They were accompanied by those New Jersey soldiers. Uh, they were told that they sang songs and read stories and took care of all the kids. They really bonded. After those three days and two nights, they, they, they can tell it was really hot, they showed up in a place called Lone Pine. And this is a, train, a bus station, a train station in California. It's in the high Owens Valley between Los Angeles and Lake Tahoe. And there they boarded buses, of which they had to ride for another two to three and a half hours. And they arrived here at the Manzanar concentration camp on April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1942. You can see the barracks were still under construction. And this is a rare photograph, if you can read that, is this picture was taken exactly one day after those folks had arrived. You can see they're pretty hastily built, and that's pretty much what you saw. They did not have insulation, they did not have sheetrock. And they were also untreated lumber, green lumber. So when it got hot, all of those boards you see on the bottom, they shrank. So the floors would just be flown in uh, sand. Sometimes scorpions might sneak in. And they were 100, the barracks were 120 feet by 25 feet wide, broken up into six units. So that's 60 by 25. A family up to eight would live in that unit. It would have one bare light bulb and one stove. Again, no insulation, no bare walls so you can hear everything. It's as if you're in a giant barn with just a wall separating those families. And so the first several thousands who came to those camps, they were given one large sack and one small sack and directed to go to these giant bales of hay that were all over the camp, fill up those sacks as the best you could. The sack that was the largest would serve as your mattress and the small one would be your pillow. And you try to make the best of it. These are how some people dealt with their living conditions. This is a model of what Manzanar looked like at its full build-out. This is at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, the big exhibit. If you ever drop in, it's worth seeing, called America's Concentration Camp. At its peak, more than 10,000 Japanese Americans were crowded into 504 <coughs> barracks. They were organized in the 36 blocks. And you can see here, these two would be the uh, men's and women's latrine. This would be the shared mess hall. This would be a laundry facility. All of the 10 camps were placed in very far away desolate areas, and they all remember the summer being really hot and blowing sand, blowing wind, and the winter just the opposite. Freezing, icicles, none of these camps had, none, no camps had paved roads, let alone gravel roads. So when it got rainy or it got snowy and it would melt, it would just be mud. You'd see a mud between all of the barracks wherever you had to walk. This is a big, huge change, especially for the Bainbridge Islanders and all of the first-generation Japanese who really like their privacy. Here's a picture of what those latrines look like, very close together, no partitions between them. Now, there are 120,000 stories, that's of many people who are in the camps. But all 10 camps each have this one shared story. And that is of a memory of an elderly person at 2 or 3 in the morning walking to the latrine. It was dark, and it wasn't as if these old people made a lot of noise walking to the latrine. But what would happen is during the night, searchlights would go over the, the barracks all night long to watch any movement. And once they spotted someone walking, they would spot that. And these elderly people would go at 2 or 3 in the morning because it was the only time they could have privacy. They could go there and be alone to do 
their business. And of course, the first search light would follow them as if you were on a Hollywood, a Broadway stage. And then when you were waiting for you to come out and follow you back, so people remember waking up, watching elderly people go to the latrines, and that was a very hard thing for those first generation folks. Another thing, hard thing for them was eating with a bunch of strangers. I told you about those mess halls, all those mess halls you gather together, eat with these strangers. And something started happening in all these camps. Those kids, they had all this freedom. The, especially teenagers, really loved all the freedom. They had to work on a farm all day or work at their stores. And he started meeting these children and, and youth from all around other areas, all around from different parts of the country. And he started hanging out together. And the parents would let them. They'd go to different blocks where the food was better or where their friends were or whatnot. And those first generation folks said, Let's try to make life as normal for these children because we do not long know how long we're going to be here or if we're ever going to get come home. So they made as many activities as possible as if they had never been put in a concentration camp. All of the activities that they would have had back home in their cities, in their towns, they tried to make, converting barracks into schools. They also had sports and activities like this. They had dances, music, the rest. This is basketball. This is a picture of the uh, outside in the courtyard. Now, some places didn't have basketball, but all 10 camps did play one sport that everybody loved, and that was baseball, the All-American team. This is a picture of the baseball diamond, and at all camps, every 10 camp, the incarcerated themselves built the baseball diamonds and got all the equipment. They played against themselves because, remember, these are, ten, these are small cities, 10,000 people. After a while, they got tired of playing against themselves in other schools, universities, colleges, high schools, military teams would be invited to come to the camps and play against the incarcerated Japanese Americans. They were quite good. Every single camp had a winning record. This is a picture of Toyomi Itaki's, uh, this is Toyomi Itaki's picture of three boys behind barbed wire. He is a Japanese American photographer who snuck in his camera. He wasn't going to let the military take it. He took it in pieces and assembled it in the camp and started taking pictures. If you can see in the guard tower there, there's nobody there. Could, that was impossible to take that picture if there was someone in there because he's on the other side of the barbed wire. He's outside the camp. He would have been shot. Here's what this area looked like. This is the exclusion area that were set. In Washington State, it was the Columbia River, that kind of bend you see there. And then it gets to this town called Brewster. It goes north on a highway, Highway 75. In Oregon, it was about 80 miles east of Hood River and the bend you see there, Bend, Oregon. All of California and southern Arizona. If you were that 116th Japanese ancestry and lived on the west side of that border, basically that darker pink area, that was 114,000 Japanese Americans. During the course of the war, Fumiko Hayashida's and the rest, another 6,000 babies would be born in one of those 10 triangles. All told, that was 120,000 Japanese Americans placed in concentration camps, forcibly removed and excluded from their homes. That was roughly 95% of all Japanese Americans who lived um, the United States and the continental U.S. There were also more with two other countries, Italy and Germany. There were no mass exclusion orders for any of those communities. One that would have been a physical, logistical impossibility. There were about 14 million German and Italians living in the United States. I, I think New York's maybe 8 million, 9 million. So we don't have a city that could hold that many people. Uh, they did arrest about 10,000 German Americans and about 4,000 Italian Americans, but all of them were suspected of, charged with, or convicted of some crime against the United States. Sabotage, espionage, sedition, something. Not one of these 120,000 people were ever convicted, let alone charged with any kind of crime. You can see the map right there. The Bainbridge Islanders, again, went first to Minidoka, Manzanar, and then after a year, they wished to transfer to Minidoka in southern Idaho. This is two reasons. One, they were the first group in the Manzanar, but the rest of the people came, the other 9,800, were all from the Los Angeles area. And they were urban Los Angeles Japanese. And they did not get along with the country mice from Bainbridge Island, these city mice. They had what they called zoot suits. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, they had pants way up to your nipples and thing down to your ankle, the coats on your ankle, and they just didn't get along. And when Mini Doka was built, that was somebody from Seattle, went, and they had family from Seattle and friends. So almost all of them transferred to Mini Doka. The editor of the newspaper heard about these frictions happening between the Bainbridge Islanders and the Los Angeles Japanese. And when the transfer came, he wrote editorially, 
uh, this is a good move. Everybody knows you should not mix Washington apples with California lemons. <laughs> this is a map of the evacuation area. Now the Japanese Americans from Bainbridge, as you saw on the map, went straight to Manzanar, the concentration camp, still under construction. All of those camps were under construction. They could not build them fast enough. So what the Bainbridge Islanders say, yeah, it was great. It was sucked to go to a concentration camp, but at least we didn't have to go to an assembly center, of which this is. And assembly centers, here in orange in the map, Seattle and Pierce County went to the Puyallup Fairgrounds. In dark blue, Kitsap and most of King County went to the Pinedale Assembly Center outside of Fresno, California. In green, the rest of Western Washington went to the Tule Lake Assembly Center, which later got built into a full-blown concentration camp. In light blue, Eastern Washington, all those folks went to the Portland, Oregon Fairgrounds. The Santa Anita Racetrack. They had places, those are wide areas, to put people. They couldn't go to the barracks and those fairgrounds and those racetracks fast enough. So the first several thousand people who showed up at the Puyallup Fairgrounds or at the Portland, Oregon Fairgrounds, they simply put them in where the livestock had just lived, the horses, the pigs, and the cows, they clear them out and that's where your family would live where those animals had just been. Once the camps were built, they had these distribution, they had to send them off to different areas. By the way, notice here in the lower right, lower left, that's a breakout of Los Angeles. Look at the different color coding. All those color codes indicate different concentration camps. You would think that it would be smarter if you're going to put 10, 12, 8,000 people to gather 8,000 in a bunch and take them away instead of a few hundred here and there. The military did this deliberately because they wanted to split up the Japanese American community. They wanted to split up, cut, they called it cutting the head off the snake. So in Washington, in red, Seattle and Pierce County went to Minidoka. The rest of Western Washington were already at the Tule Lake camp. And Eastern Washington, big and blue here, they went to the Heart Mountain camp. And Wyoming. This is the populations at the time, like the Heart Mountain place in Wyoming. At its peak, it was the largest city in Wyoming. And th this does not include the thousands and thousands of personnel, both from the uh, relocation authority and from the military, who were also guiding those folks. We had a sense of how the community was moving, their life was going normally, and then the war continued. The United States lost about 500,000 lives in the war, right around the 400,000 mark. They were meeting people, so they came to the concentration camps and asked these Japanese Americans to the first enlist, and then they got drafted. This is a picture of Artura, who was just married to Flo, and he volunteered. Out of the 276 Japanese Americans on Bainbridge Island, 68 either volunteered or were drafted into the military. 66 men and two women. Essentially, everybody who was eligible did go. Art was one of the 13 that joined something called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. This was a segregated all Japanese American unit that fought in Europe. They were known as the Purple Heart Battalion. Purple Hearts, as most of you know, when you get injured or die in war, you get a Purple Heart. They had more Purple Hearts per capita than any other unit in military history. They fought with incredible valor. It is something that changed the course of, at least for many people in America, how they viewed Japanese Americans. There was the Race to Save the Lost Battalion. It was a Texas group. It was the pride of Texas. You know, there were Rangers, there were Texas Rangers first, and these rough and ready cowboys. And they got captured, I mean, cap they got surrounded by the Nazis on three sides of Germans. Two attempts by the Allies to save them failed. The, and this is in France. 442nd had just fought a, a battle in Northern Italy. They arrived at the sea. They had one day rest. They were commanded to go save that battalion. So they went up. They saved 211 out of those 275 that were pinned down. But 161 of the 442nd died during that. More than 1,200 of them had casualties, and 42 of them were captured by the Nazis. There's thing called presidential unit citations. Given to groups, given to maybe a, a battleship, any group that does something extraordinarily out of valor, more valor than normally expected, only about 5% of any ship uh, Italian group gets a presidential unit citation. In their short three years, the, jet, the 442nd received seven presidential citations. And when they saved the lost battalion, that was covered nationwide because they were so famous. A lot of people said, wait a second, the Texans were saved by those Japanese? So it kind of blew a lot of people's mind. And so that's, people started having a better impression. And the lost battalion and 442nd, what's left of them, they're all in their 90s now. Um, they meet every year. 
the Lost Battalion has a huge banquet for these survivors from the, the 442nd to thank them. Now, before you could even get enlisted or drafted, it made you fill out a questionnaire, a loyalty questionnaire. You can read, everybody can read these, right? Can you use them back? So the first one said, are you going to serve the United States? And some of those young men said, I'm a U.S. citizen. I have constitutional rights. How can I fight for liberty and freedom when I don't have either? You let my family out of this camp, I'll certainly fight for the liberties and freedom you say you guarantee me. And so some of those young men said no to this question. This question 28 is the allegiance question. Swearing all allegiance to the U.S. and four swearing allegiance to the nation of Japan and the emperor. Some of these men also said, who the hell's the emperor? They didn't know that. They didn't know anything about Japan. They were born in the United States, have no collection whatsoever of Japan. And a lot of them said, this is a trick question. For swearing allegiance means you forgive allegiance. Well, how can I, I never had allegiance to the Japan and, and, German, and the emperor in the first place. So that if, I, if you say yes, you are implying that you had previous allegiance to the enemy nation. So they didn't like that either. Many families had tough times with this. A lot of parents say, answer yes, yes, don't be a troublemaker. Don't rock the boat. Some have families had some boys say no, no, and some say yes, yes. And imagine you were one of those families that had a 442nd or any of the other fighting groups, and you had lost your son in that 161 of them died saving that lost battalion. And you have these people saying, no, I'm not going to fight for our country. The split in the Japanese-American community was very deep, and it stayed for many, many years. They were known as no-no boys, they were called resistors, and they were all sent to the Tule Lake Concentration Camp in California, which was a prison incarceration center inside of a concentration camp a special place for these people that felt they felt were very disloyal. These were perhaps the three most outrageous known of boys, most forward resistors. Gordon Hirabayashi, Minori Asui, and Fred Normatsu. Gordon Hirabayashi was a student at the University of Washington from the White River area. Minori Asui was from Hood River, Oregon, and Fred Koromatsu was from Oakland, California. All of them were in their early 20s. And they said, this is unconstitutional. What this order is, what we're doing to our entire community. We're U.S. citizens. We were born here. Here's our birthright. Mr. Hirabayashi and Mr. Yasui both defied the curfew. They said, you're not, a, not making the Italian and German people. They can walk around. Gordon's story, he had to go to the police three times. They finally arrested him. He was convicted. I mean, convicted, yeah. And, and he stayed in King County Jail. Go to the King County Jail. There's a special plaque showing that he was there and that his papers. He was convicted. He had to report for his federal prison in Arizona. This is wartime, though. There's gas rationing, transportation's hard to come by. So he had to hitchhike to Arizona. Then he got to the prison in Arizona. The papers weren't there, so he had to convince them to put him in the prison because I was supposed to be here. All of their convictions, those two convictions went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they were upheld unanimously that the government had a right to do this to U.S. citizens. Fred Korematsu had a different tact. He refused to go to the concentration camp. He was hiding out with his Italian-American girlfriend. He was spotted, arrested, and he was also convicted. His case also went to the United States Supreme Court, but his was a 6-3 split decision. Because three of the senators said, well, he's right, he is a US citizen. And you can't forcibly take these people without a trial, without a charge. But their convictions were all upheld. Now, we were also at war with these two countries, right? I mentioned there was no mass exclusion of any of those countries. But had there been, for let's say Italian-Americans, this Italian-American may not have had his career, and Marilyn Monroe would have probably had a different first husband. And this German-American, Milton Eisenhower, I mean, Dwight Eisenhower, he, led, he was the five-star general who led the entire Allied forces to victories over Japan, Italy, and Germany. Maybe if he had not been in that role, it might have been a different outcome in the war, and he might not become a U.S. president. Things against the Constitution because of the Bill of Rights. The Fourth Amendment is the, you are protected. Your persons and property are protected. You must have a search warrant. You cannot enter a home or take anything that is a possession of yours without a court order or a right. You can't have that right taken away. All of those homes up and down the West Coast were raided without a single search warrant. The Fifth Amendment is real powerful. That's the one you hear often. You can't testify against yourself, you can't incriminate yourself, but you can read that for yourself. No person shall. It's the only governing document, I believe in history, that says person's rights. All other documents that are the republics, democracies, and the rest say citizen's rights. And this is really important in today's context.
because all of those first generation Japanese Americans, even though they were forbidden to apply for citizenship, they're still persons. They're still persons. They still have, you, you can't have, do, do a thing without a due process. Their liberty was taken away, their place in camp. And this is the only country, now think about this. You cross the border of Canada or Mexico, you get to here, however you get here, you get off a cruise ship at, at Port of Seattle, you, you get off a cargo container ship, and you set foot. No matter what country you're of origin, no matter what your religion, the minute you set foot on American soil, this Fifth Amendment covers you. This is really important. That's why the immigration debate is so important, because there is there's a violation of some of these rights. Other countries, you can't have that right. And then there's the 14th Amendment. This is the amendment that says equal protection under the law. But more importantly, if you were born here, you are a U.S. citizen. 75,000 of those people were U.S. citizens. And yet the Supreme Court, how Korematsu's conviction and Yasui's and Hirabayashi's conviction, those last two guys unanimously, how could they do this? Well, Diego Hoover, the FBI director, had been surveilling all of the Japanese Americans for more than three years. He had a database file of everybody of 116th Japanese ancestry, and every time a baby was born, a new file was created. So he had the actual data. When they came to Bainbridge Island, the FBI, on February 2nd, 1942, they raided all 50 homes simultaneously with the assistance of the Kitsap County Sheriffs and Deputies and Washington State Patrol Troopers. And they wanted to hit every home simultaneously so no, no family could tip off another family that the FBI was there. And this is pretty amazing, considering 78 years ago, there were maybe eight or nine roads on Bainbridge that had names. So the actual data that they had was pretty extraordinary. There's no GPS, they had a, a computer database. This was pretty extraordinary surveillance and data collection by the FBI. But he said, I've got nothing. He was more worried about the German Americans. He was worried about a group called the Bund in the northeast part of Germany and, and, and the United States. They were having pro-Hitler rallies, pro-Third Reich rallies every week. There was a standing room only rally of Nazis in Madison Square Garden in 1939, prior to our entry into war. And those are among the 10,000 people that he got arrested. So he said, I'm not worried about the Japanese. And the Attorney General, General Biddle, to his credit, said, Mr. President, the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, this will not stand constitutional mat mat muster. And it said as much to the courts. And yet this, their convictions are upheld. So how, how can you do You simply reclassify people. So you're no longer a person, you are an alien. And you're no longer a Japanese American citizen, you are a non-alien. It's a simple line written in these administrative documents. This isn't even law. These are just administrative documents that exclusion order. And because of those two distinctions, because of those new two subclassifications of citizenship and personhood, the Supreme Court said, well, technically, you're not a citizen during time of war. This is something that we have to do to protect ourselves. That's why those convictions were upheld. So do we do that? This is the Manzanar National Historic Site. If you ever go there, it's a tremendous facility. You can see the picture you saw earlier of the USS Arizona sinking on December 7, 1941, superimposed over the twin World Trade Center towers falling on September 11, 2001. And I hope you can read that top, everyone can read that top line. And the, so this is how people reacted after Pearl Harbor happened. And this is how people reacted after September 11, 2001. This picture is taken from Beacon Hill in Seattle. War is a difficult thing, unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath. You're not prone to kill. You just don't do that. So how do you motivate normal people to do those kind of violent acts in war? And the way you do that is you instill your patriotism, of course, but you make your enemy something bad, something that must be stopped. And in World War I, the Germans knew that that was powerful, that they could do it through visual images. And so they took it literally to a new art form. You've never seen propaganda like this. You can see here the Bolshevik, look how dark and menacing, the giant dagger, the woman with her child there, and all that. So that's one way to make your enemy just so sinister, so evil, or make your enemy not even human. 
pictures of the British coming across the English Channel. And then the sharp eyes there, you can see that he's got a web, and Uncle Sam is over there, um, over in England. And worse, there are some images that quite literally you might call prop. I would call them uh, uh, pornographic. And we were so disturbed by these when they had that, that we as a nation, we said we have higher values than that. We would not stoop to that level like they did. And officially set that as an interpretation of how the United States would do that, would go on during the war. But after World War II started, And after September 11th, organizations and sometimes businesses themselves, and they're all printed at U.S. government taxpayer expense. Many of you know, every person of the Islamic faith must visit Mecca once in their lives with the pilgrimage. There's about a million people in this photograph. The next image I'm going to show you is something that was very popular to show how patriotic you were. Nowadays you wear a little flag lapel pin and you yellow ribbons you know, indicating you know, a person fighting for you away from your family. But these were given out to show, are you really an American? Are you really for the war fight? They're handed out by businesses, schools, universities, churches. It's a very popular item to show how patriotic you were. Bottom says this permit may be used in conjunction with permit number 38, mosque destruction. Please give 24 hours notice to local fire departments prior to deconstruction. This was given out by our U.S. government to Marines who passed their either recruits and or draftees after they passed their marksmanship classes. It's hard to read in the middle there, but it says, you're hereby authorized to observe open season on all Japanese who are ever contacted. The license carries no bag limit and may be used during good advantage during blackout hours. Hot lead leaves them dead. Blackout hours were those hours in the evening when everybody on the coastal town had to turn off their lights, lock their windows because they did not want the city to be seen from the ocean, from the water. Blackout hours meant civilian populations on the west coast. There aren't blackout hours on the battlefield. This was a fundraising effort by a man in uh, Missouri. He was successful and he later uh, won made thousands of dollars off of this fundraising appeal, but he left after a scandal. This is a picture of Gerald Ford. He was a U.S. president, Republican from Michigan. And in 1976, he did something pretty extraordinary. On our bicentennial year, July 4th, 1976, he chose that day to rescind Executive Order 9066. He said, this is not what America stands for. Let's get rid of it. I'm going to take it off the books. That started a movement among my generation, third generation, to speak out about this. And he was defeated later that year by this man, President Carter, Democrat from Georgia. He created a bipartisan commission called the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians to study this record, to look into it. Yeah, he got scholars, constitutional experts, historians. But he was defeated in 1980 by this man, Republican governor from California, Ronald Reagan. And he continued that commission. And in December of 1982, they published this report. And after two years and 10 hearings, this 750 witnesses, it was a more, almost 500 page report, found that there was no ev documented evidence of espionage or sabotage, nor was there any military necessity for the mass exclusion and incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans. They said it was founded on these three things and these three things only. This started a movement of redress. These are, these are young people who were young, and the men in the middle there. That's Fred Korematsu. They took their case to the court. All of their convictions were overturned thanks to the information they got from that court. 
and they started the movement. These are the legislative leaders in Congress. And in 1988, August 10th, there's Ronald Reagan. He was the president. He signed the Civil Liberties Act into law. I'd like to point out, no one cared if he wore tan suit then. Um, this is about honor. This is Walt and Only Woodward, the publishers of the Paper John and Review, a young couple in their 30s. He was a Seattle Times reporter, she's a writer. Six months after they bought their paper, the Pearl Harbor happened. They put on an extra that day saying, don't run the mob rule, these are our friends and neighbors. When Roosevelt signed his executive order, he wrote a blistering editorial saying, Mr. President, these are US citizens. He's the only newspaper in America that, would, that held up all throughout the war editorials and positions against the administration's unconstitutional actions and supporting Japanese Americans. No other paper did that for the war. They also had people write back from the camps, so there's always something told about those Japanese Americans as friends and neighbors behind the wall, behind barbed wire. Because of that, because of how tight this community was, out of the 276, 150 came back. And, and some of those didn't have a kid to buy their property in their name or maybe couldn't afford to buy land. We may have been close to 230, 240. There's not a city, county, or area within, from, California, from Arizona to Canada that even comes close to 15% return. Seattle was around 15% return. Because the hate group was strong, but Bainbridge was different from the outset. But I'm not giving a Pollyanna view of Bainbridge. This white supremacist from Bainbridge Island wrote this pamphlet. It was spread up and down the West Coast. I saw it in the San Diego Museum. So he had that view. It's written in this book. I hope it's here. Here's a picture of Fumiko, now her grown daughter. So we wanted to memorialize this place. We didn't care if it was a national park, historic site, landmark. This is a picture of her testifying to Congress for the act. The shoulder you see there, then Congressman James Lee. Every time our bill was up for review, I mean both, it was unanimous. And we won. And we became a unit of the National Park Service. So this is where they walk down. And if you come, we built it on the very path where they walked down to the ferry. It's located on the south side of the harbor. First and different materials, you see this pavilion. I'm going to go through this because I see we're running out of time. And the site, it's granite, no growth cedar. And from the beginning, the Doto Nayoni, let it not happen again is our motto. From there all the way to the end, it's 276 feet long, one foot for every Japanese American who lived on Bainbridge Island. It tells a story at the first panel. Every name, every family is put together by their family name and their age at the time. This first panel's inscription reads, I came to Bainbridge Island in 1908. Bainbridge was a good place to leave a family, Tomotichi Nishinaka. Above the school, by the flag, I was born and raised on Bainbridge Island, and I'm a 100% American citizen. We will protect our flag, the United States flag. Above his mitt. Just a week before we were to leave, Coach Pop Miller put in all of the Japanese Americans. Despite our errors and not hitting, they let us play the whole game. We lost 15 to 2 all the time. Above the blue heron, we, I felt like a second class citizen would be heard under the boat by soldiers with bayonets. It was the most humiliating experience in my life. I saw me in the town. I think we were really careful. We were prisoners that they had guns with spears. This is the only one that's three dimensional. It has barbed wire in the front. On the left, it moves. The searchlight played on our window all night, back and forth. We couldn't sleep. Summing the cow. The other quote on the right. Back home at graduation, they had 13 empty chairs on the stage. That day, I felt so empty and sad. I sat on my bunk and I cried. The Hoku Takaya Moto. Here we don't have the wall because for three years there were no Japanese Americans on Cambridge Island, of which this wall represents. So in its place is this model that represents the Minidoka concentration camp. This last panel. And here, this is the return. One thing you'll notice, this is in full color, the three panel. We want the return to be bright, green grass, blue skies, because it was something that we should celebrate of how they welcomed their friends and that. This is says, I was kind of afraid, but the neighbor girl that I used to play with came up and welcomed me. We put the farm under Mr. Raider's name while we were gone. When we came back, he returned to us. My father and his brother worked so hard to build up neighbor's gardens. When we returned, there was nothing left. We must have broken. So you leave our site. You see these wayside panels. 
I'm going to trust you can read that for yourself. Turn to our site, leave it, we'll see if there's going to have future plans to build an outdoor amphitheater, some of frame building, go down the hill. What do you want from this? This is the Pledge of Allegiance as it existed in 1942, and where God was not added until 1951. This is a wonderful speech from my mentor, Dr. Frankie Amore, before he died. We would argue this, that it is the opposite of, the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. Fear creates the hate. All of the stuff that happened, all the propaganda you see, and all the propaganda you see today, is manufactured fear to make you feel fear, anxiety, and be afraid. And it's not real. There's nothing to be afraid about. And it is happening again. We talked about the, the parents being taken away. That's family separation. They were, people were run through their homes without search warrants. People were raided. Yeah. People are incarcerated in places. That's happening. Separating children, putting people away because of their religion. We're letting it happen again. This is our aspirational goal. But it's more than aspiration that we hope to inspire you with. We want this to be a course of action. Stand up. The Bay Bridge Islanders did. They stood by their friends and neighbors. They had their back. The rest of the country did not follow that diet. They were totally different. But they said, no, this is the way, not only my friends and neighbors, it's their constitutional right to be back. They should not be in those camps. They have the courage to stand up. And they set a different example for our country. And I hope everybody will do that for those people who may not know them, but they deserve the support and rights just like you have. Thank you very much. Come to the site in, in about a month and see what's going on.